Good evening. Good evening, and we'll, we'll go ahead and start in a few minutes. If those of you uh, who are just coming in could please take a seat. Be great. Everybody's so quiet. Is, it, is there a raffle going on or something? I mean, this is... Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Dr. Jim Hornstein, and I am the chairman of the Ethics Committee at the Community Memorial Health Systems, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the first Ethics in Healthcare series for 2015. To me, it's remarkable that we are beginning our third year in this community ethics program. Our goal when we started back in 2013 was to create a free public forum where we in medicine could share important and meaningful topics with you, our neighbors, our community, and our leaders. Over the past several years, we have met and discussed serious subjects many times, subjects such as healthcare reform and Obamacare, the complexities of helping our aging parents get older, the legitimate use of medical marijuana, and the role of religion in modern American healthcare. We have presented these and other controversial topics not because they are easy, but because they are important. This evening, before I begin tonight's exceptional program, it's important for me to acknowledge the 100% support given to this series by our hosts, the Community Memorial Health Systems. First, I'd like to thank you formally to its board of directors, its administration, and especially their dedicated and extremely caring professional staff. But I also want to give a special thanks to Mr. Mike Ellenson, standing in the back, uh, Vice President of Marketing Development, in addition to Ms. Mary McCormick, Manager of Marketing, and Mr. Rick Ruffinelli of Zestnet. Rick, I don't see you. Um, but all of these three people, in addition to the entire family at Community Memorial Health System, have been absolutely generous with their time, helpful with their comments, and for me, relaxed with their deadlines, as we have collectively, <laughs> as we have collectively worked together over the past three years to bring you these programs. So ladies and gentlemen, can we please stop just for a second and thank the Community Memorial Health Systems for hosting this event. <laughs> and now I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce tonight's program. One of the first things one is taught in medical school is never, never, ever talk in public places about your patients. The reason, of course, for this has a lot to do with confidentiality. But that is hardly the only reason. When doctors talk openly about patients, everyone, and I mean everyone, likes to listen to us. Even today, if some of you ride in hospital elevators or sit in hospital cafeterias, you will actually see signs posted reminding doctors not to talk about patients because patients, their families, and the community are listening. So why do people listen? One of the reasons people listen is because some of the stories that they hear are about patients whose lives are frankly interesting or simply on their own sake, something they want to hear about. As the National Enquirer says, which is of course our Bible in medicine, <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. But there are really other reasons and perhaps more profound reasons why people listen to doctors' stories. Some stories bring to light the hidden world between doctors and patients. Some stories demonstrate moving examples of tremendous heroism, while others point to the, our tragic human failings, where all of these stories interest us deeply. Why? Because these stories are about us, are about all of us, everybody in this room, everybody we love, all of our friends and neighbors, our communities, 
every human that's ever walked on the earth, because we all face the common realities of illness and unfortunately even death. Many doctor-patient stories expose us to incredible universal lessons about humanity itself, including insights into the meaning of life, the meaning of death, and the things which frankly matter most to us, our families, our friends, our communities, our religions, our God. Tonight, four doctors are going to break their professional silence and share with you extraordinary and profoundly personal stories which have touched them personally and affected their lives, both as healers and as persons. Now, everything you hear tonight, everything you hear tonight is true. However, because this is an ethics program, we still have a binding obligation to protect confidentiality. While the stories and medical facts remain unaltered, the identity of patients must, of course, remain well hidden. In all cases, the names have been changed, but more than that, sometimes a man might become a woman, somebody young might become old, someone from one ethnicity may become another. However, this common confidentiality divorce will not change the fundamental lessons of any of these stories, and we hope that you find them as we do, sometimes incredibly serious, sometimes funny, occasionally bizarre, but always honoring the personal relationship between two people forever linked together by this amazing bond, which we call the doctor-patient relationship. Our format tonight will be for each of our speakers to share three separate stories, and then time permitting, we will try to enter a lightning round, so this is extra credit, a bonus, where we will ask each of our storytellers what was their most funny, their most embarrassing, their most surprising, and their most painful tales. So now, without further ado, let's begin. Our first storyteller will be one of medicine's newest physicians, Dr. Jennifer Vinson. Dr. Vinson was born and raised in Valencia, California, and graduated from UCSB and Cal State Fullerton with a bachelor's degree in cell development and biology. She completed medical school at Western University, and she began her internship in family medicine at the Community Memorial Health Systems just eight months ago. On a somewhat personal level, Dr. Vincent is engaged to be married in October to her fiance, Adam, who, Adam, is here. <laughs> That's a very good sign that Adam is here. Can't we agree? <laughs> Dr. Vincent, all the best from all of us here. Supporting Jennifer also tonight is her sister Jessica, a nurse at Cottage Hospital, her parents Steve and Janet, her grandparents Bob and Lois, and especially special for uh, Dr. Vincent, I would like to give a special shout out to her fellow interns, residents, and teachers of the residency programs at the Community and Moral Health Systems. Anybody from the residency or internship or teachers, would you please stand and be acknowledged? <laughs> now, who's watching the hospital? <laughs> we'll worry about that later. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my deepest pleasure to introduce my newest professional colleague, Dr. Jennifer Vinson. Thank you, Dr. Hornstein. Uh, so as a physician, we are expected to not show weakness and that we can't say no. Sometimes we're even seen as a different class of people without limitations. However, I learned that even as a physician, we have limits as a person that can affect how we are able to do our job as a physician. I'm the youngest in this group of distinguished physicians, 
and I'm so honored and humbled to be able to share some experiences with you that I've gathered on my journey thus far. I went into medicine to not only help people, but to partner with them through their life. That is specifically why I went into family medicine. In the past few years, I've been filled with college, medical school, and now residency. We're on a perpetual loop of studying, working, testing, and our first few years of training that we jump, literally jump at any opportunity we have to actually see a patient and help them out if we can. We learn very quickly that it's extremely rare for a patient to come into our offices with a problem or an issue, be treated in the office, and go home better. Many problems that we see are chronic in nature and can take months to years to fully understand and to get under control. One of the problems that we can face that can bring immediate satisfaction to our patients is cerumen impaction. Now cerumen, or earwax as it's more commonly known, seems like a really mundane thing and I bet none of you ever really think about it unless it's bothering you. But I can tell you it's very exciting and satisfying when a patient walks into the office with a problem we can actually fix and not just treat. The patient feels better, we're super excited, the earwax is gone, and that's why I went into medicine. <laughs> so during one day, my rotation in third year of medical school, a patient was coming in for earwax removal, which is done with this ear lavage system in which kind of sprays water out into a jet stream so that you can easily remove the wax. When I saw this listed on the schedule for that day, I realized this is why I went into medicine. I was gonna beat the earwax, and it didn't even know what it was up against. But unfortunately, I had the stomach flu for the few days prior, and I was not feeling my best. But I was not gonna let that stop my domination over this earwax. I walked into the patient's room and explained the procedure to him. I had my attending with me who guided me through the process and proctored me during the procedure. The patient was apprehensive since he had never had this procedure done before. And I was young, anxious, and still not feeling very well, which is pretty much a really awful combination. So as we began, I was breaking little parts of the earwax off, and I knew something was wrong. I began seeing spots, my legs became jello, and I knew that this battle was not gonna be won against this earwax. I realized that I needed to step down from this battle and go and sit down. But unfortunately, as many of you know, exam rooms aren't the most roomy of rooms you can find, and there was not a place for me to sit down. So I mumbled something to my attending that I needed to leave for a second, and I thought that I walked out of the room, but I didn't. Unfortunately, I had passed out with my hand still on the handle of the door. And if that's not bad enough, the ear lavage system was not turned off. So water is spraying everywhere. My attending and the patient are screaming at me. They don't know what's happening. And I realize that I'm on the ground with my hand on the handle of the door, and I can't get up because my legs are gone. So I did what any good resident, I mean, medical student would do, and I crawled on my hands and knees out of that exam room with my head held high. <laughs> I was physically, professionally, and emotionally beat by earwax that day. The war was not won. Earwax had won, I had zero. I felt defeated. Looking back now, I was trying so hard to cure the patient and satisfy my selfish need of helping somebody. This was the reason I'd gone into medicine in the first place. However, that earwax taught me something very important that day. I need to help myself as well and not forget about my own well-being physically and emotionally. I cannot help others if I do not first check in with myself. Make sure that I'm okay. I need to help myself as well. As much as I really do hate earwax, and I hate it a lot, I do owe it a lot too. It taught me the valuable life lesson that I can only be as effective as my own humanity. I have a limit and I need to address that. It's okay to say no or to ask for help when needed. You need humor and perspective in this job and the ability to, to, and the ability to take care of others as well as the ability to take care of yourself. And in case anyone's keeping score, I've beat every single case of earwax after that. <laughs> Thank you.
who knew earwax could be so evil? I mean, <laughs> our next physician storyteller is Dr. Gus Awasiak. Dr. Awasiak was born and raised in Linz, Austria, and immigrated to the United States at age 11. He grew up in Chicago, Illinois, and attended Bradley University, also in Illinois. For medical school, Dr. Awasiak spent two years at the University of Illinois, but finally came to his senses and transferred to UCLA, <laughs> a fellow Bruin, where he received his medical degree. He did his internship at the Los Angeles County General Hospital and his residency in family medicine at the Ventura County General Hospital. For years, he practiced family medicine in Santa Paula, but decided to become a surgeon instead and obtained his surgical training after practicing from UC Irvine and also Cottage Hospital in Santa Barbara. Fortunately for us, Dr. Rossiak is currently the Program Director for General Surgery at the Community Memorial Health System. Altogether, he has practiced medicine for over 45 years. Yes. <laughs> and if you like that, on a personal level, Dr. Rossiak has been married for 47 years to his wife, Mary, and has one daughter and two granddaughters. <laughs> Dr. Wasiak is a man of letters and has written many journal, journal articles, uh, including, and in addition to two books, one currently in print called Tales of a Country Surgeon, and the other, Vladimir's Vision, a biography of his father and his father's artworks. In his spare time, Dr. Awasiak is also a farmer, and he, he cultivates over 100 acres of oranges, avocados, and apple trees. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, surgeon and farmer, Dr. Gus Awasiak. Jim, thank you for that introduction. A uh, little exaggerated, but basically right. So uh, it's hard to fall on earwax, you know. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I've had similar situations where before I was uh, actually a physician, when I was still in high school, my dad took me to surgery. He was a physician. And I remember fainting on the back of the surgeon doing the operation. <laughs> And he tossed me off like a sack of potatoes. Uh, so I, I know all about uh, the earwax feigning story. So I'm going to talk about uh, my first story. Is Actually, I'm going to read to you from my book, which is You Saw Tales of a Country Surgeon, uh, available at Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I chose to read it to you for Two reasons. Number one, I think it's a better read than a, than a tell. But the more important reason, it's a shameless way to get an ad in for my book. <laughs> my topic is uh, cheerful. It's death and dying. Uh, and it's chapter 15 in my book. So I'm going to read it to you. And uh, the other stories are, I'm going to tell. I'm not going to read. But I thought this would be a, a nice introduction to a, a very serious subject. Uh, I have a little preamble to every uh, chapter, and this one's preamble is, life is a sexually acquired fatal illness. Think about it. <laughs> so, death and dying. Our medical practice was busier than ever, and this was in my family practice days when I was a GP in Santa Paula. And I see two nurses from Santa Paula that actually may remember this scenario, Maybe not. In any case, forget the names. <laughs> we saw a large volume and a great variety of illnesses in this rural community with its 49-bed hospital. Smoking was prevalent among our patients, a nasty habit that brought with it emphysema, heart disease, and lung cancer. 
One of my patients was admitted with, a, with horrible COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. He was already on home oxygen, but still smoking. That was no longer enough. The oxygen didn't help him. He had to be admitted. Every breath was an effort. As mundane but as essential activity as going to the bathroom was nearly impossible. Upon admission, he was near death. Nothing we did helped him. To see such a person struggle for every breath, all muscles straining to get one more wisp of air into the lungs, the nostrils flaring, the chest heaving, the neck stretched forward was truly agony for the patient and even somebody watching this. His nail beds and lips were deep blue. He could not pay attention to you because every fiber of his being was concentrated on taking a breath, which might be his last. The time had come to put him on a ventilator with little hope of ever getting him off. I inserted the endotracheal tube, a clear plastic tube that is put through the mouth or the nose into the trachea, the breathing tube. This is done with an instrument called the laryngoscope that pushes the tongue down out of the way so you can see the vocal cords. And then you advance the tube through that vocal cord void in the trachea. It requires sedation often and even paralysis sometimes, but in this case I was afraid to sedate him because he was already quite sedated from the low oxygen and high carbon dioxide in his bloodstream. I also hesitated to give a paralyzing drug because if I were not able to intubate the trachea and he were paralyzed, we'd both be in serious trouble. So I did it without medication. Uh, he didn't seem to mind. Uh, at least he put up no resistance. The tube went in easily. He had no teeth to worry about because the laryngoscope being metal can sometimes chip a tooth. I was glad he didn't have any teeth. <laughs> He took to the ventilator like a duck takes to water. He became more alert, and now I could give him some morphine to ease his discomfort. Despite my best efforts, however, he developed ventilator-acquired pneumonia. The ventilator is not meant to take over for weeks. It can be used for a few days, but anything over that, the lung becomes seeded with bacteria, just like a fertile garden gets weeds. The various antibiotics strike out one by one as the bugs learn to overcome the drugs through a process of survival of the fittest. The first strike with antibiotics kills most bacteria, but a few do survive. These are the strong ones. Uh, then they grow and flourish. A new drug is chosen, and the process begins anew. More bacteria are killed, but again, a few survive, and now he, there are two bugs that are resistant to antibiotics. This repeats itself over and over again, and you breed the Godzilla bug that nothing can kill. The man's death spiral began. The pneumonia involved more and more of the lung. The last x-ray looked like there was no lung left. How could he still be alive? It seemed impossible. Finally, the inevitable happened. He died. His wife was furious. Not that he died, but that he was exposed to such suffering and, in fact, torture. And he endured it at my hands. You will never get a chance to do this to me. I will not permit it, she said. She was a heavy smoker, too. Less than a year later, she was in the same ICU bed as her husband was a few months before, suffering from the same disease. She, too, was headed for the ventilator. I knew her wishes. She was not going to permit extraordinary means to continue her life. That night, she got worse. It was a very busy night for me. I had other major duties, major problems, a car accident, a gunshot, and a heart attack that needed the ICU. The ICU was full. Somebody had to be moved. And she was the obvious choice because she did not require ICU care because she refused the ventilator. We started to move her bed out of the ICU when she looked at me with tears in her eyes, gasping with every syllable, she said, you're not gonna give up, are you? 
When it came right down to it, she wanted every chance to live, including the ventilator, despite the torture and suffering, despite the brutal experience of her husband. So that's what we did. She had a better outcome, at least for a while. She did die a year later. It's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Allison Schumann. Dr. Schumann was born and raised in New Jersey, growing up near Princeton University. She attended college at Rutgers University, where she graduated magna cum laude with degrees in the biological sciences and art history. Dr. Schumann attended Rutgers University also for medical school, where she was the class valedictorian and graduated with a 4.0 average throughout medical school. <laughs> for those of you who have been out of school for a while, that means she went through four years of medical school with all A's. She attended her residency in pediatrics at New York Presbyterian Cornell Hospital and completed her training in Pediatric Critical Care Fellowship in New York City. Currently, Dr. Schumann is a pediatric hospitalist at Community Memorial Hospital and also a leading pediatric teacher for all of our residency programs at the Centers for Family Health through the Community Memorial Health Systems. On a personal note, Dr. Schumann is married to her husband, Chris, Chris is right here. <laughs> Chris is very comfortable here. Uh, Chris was born and raised in Ventura. And uh, Allie told me she loves to read and do crossword puzzles and play with her cat, Milton. Perhaps the most completely surprising thing that I learned while interviewing all of our doctors was that in her free time, Allison is an aggressive fit CrossFit athlete, and especially enjoys lifting heavy weights, which I'm sure will be obvious to all of you when you see her. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce my dear colleague, the very buff Dr. Allison <laughs> Schumann. <laughs> Thank you. That's my brother. So he's important also. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Hornstein. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, I'm a pediatrician, and so stories about children can be very lighthearted and fun. Often in medicine, um, they uh, tug at the heartstrings a bit more, and so I do not think I'll be quite as funny as Dr. Vinson, um, but hopefully I'll be as entertaining. So I began medical school in 1999. It was uh, a wonderful reprieve from the year off that I took between college and medical school when I waitressed. So I entered with a significant amount of enthusiasm not to be serving people uh, French fries and Jack Daniels chicken at two o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> uh, the first two years of medical school are spent doing only classroom work, at least where I went to school. And so you spend every day from eight to five sitting in a lecture room and you dream of the day you will put on that white coat and be allowed to cross the doors into the hospital. My medical school was attached to a large university hospital in Newark, New Jersey. And once in a blue moon, as I walked toward my classes, I would see those double doors open and see the people on the other side and, and just wait for the day I could be a part of that. And so finally my third year came and with that same great enthusiasm, I crossed the doors to the other side and I started my internal medicine rotation and I hated it. 
I loved the information. I loved the study of medicine. I hated, no offense to all the adults here, taking care of grown-ups. I got no pleasure in seeing my patients during the day. And I thought, okay, perhaps this is just internal medicine. Something else will be better. And next, I did family practice, which was just like internal medicine, but with less interesting problems in my view. <laughs> no offense, Dr. Vinson. <laughs> <laughs> then I did surgery, and I am not a morning person, and so I hated it. And then I thought, oh no, I've made a gigantic mistake. I do not want to be a doctor. I don't like anything in the practice of medicine. Yes, I love the study of medicine, but the practice does nothing for me. In the spring of that third year, I started my pediatric rotation feeling defeated and a little bit sad. I'd obviously invested many years getting to this point, and I'm definitely not a quitter, and I wasn't really sure what to do. This particular rotation was eight weeks long, and about two weeks in, I began realizing, hmm, I sort of don't mind getting up and coming into the hospital for this rotation. That's not so bad. Every morning when we would get to the hospital, we would sit with the team that had been on call the night before, and we would get report about the patients who had been admitted to the hospital the previous evening. On this particular morning, the story was there were two young brothers, five and three. They had been taken out of their mother's custody as young infants and placed with an aunt. The reason they'd been admitted to our hospital was that they'd been found in the basement of the aunt's house, chained to a radiator, malnourished, uncared for. And so our job was to obviously medically make sure that they had the care they need, but to also obviously keep them safe until an appropriate home could be found for them. Understandably, these boys were very nervous in the first days with us in the hospital. They had suffered unimaginable tragedy and had no reason to trust us any more than they trusted any other adult they'd come in contact with. But as the days progressed, we noticed a change in them. As we would sit at the desks by the nurse's station, little by little, we would see them starting to play superhero with us, come out with bed sheets wrapped around their necks as makeshift capes. They would laugh when we would go into the room to examine them in the morning and tickle their bellies, which you can't do with adult patients. They don't appreciate that. <laughs> And I began to realize this was what I'd been missing. This was the joy that I had been looking for in all my other rotations but hadn't found. Not just the giving of medical care, but more importantly, to take an experience that for all intents and purposes should be a scary one. A hospital, a father once told me, I like to call it a hospital, but without the fun. He told me it was more like a prison, but without the bars. So for all intents and purposes, these little boys were in a new prison, a better prison, but a prison nonetheless. But our ability to interact with them and care for them gave them not fear in what should be a fearful situation, but joy and pleasure and play. And I realized what an amazing job, what an amazing field to be able to go to work and not just care for the bodies of my children, but to care for them as people, to create a safe environment, to create a place that they can be children while they heal. That day, I became a pediatrician, and I've never looked back. Thank you.
Are you liking these? <laughs> it's a good looking guy. <laughs> Our last storyteller is uh, uh, me. Um, it's hard to talk about myself in the third person, so excuse me. Dr. Jim Hornstein was born and raised in Los Angeles. I'm one of the three and graduated college of the, at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, while some people were getting 4.0s in school, I was getting tear cast at People's Park. So we had slightly a different experience. Um, uh, Dr. Ornstein graduated medical school at UCLA and completed his residency training in family medicine at the Ventura County Medical Center. I also completed an advanced degree in bioethics from Loyola Marymount University, and I am double boarded in the newest field of palliative medicine. I have spent my entire career practicing medicine on Loma Vista Avenue. I have been married for 34 years to my long-suffering wife, Dana, and I have three and a half wonderful children, my son Josh is a practicing internist at the VA hospital in Los Angeles and also has a clinical appointment at UCLA. The one half is Jessica, his beautiful uh, fiance, who will be married uh, to my son in eight weeks. Rachel, my middle daughter, works in health policy at the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C., uh, running Obamacare so you can send her all the feelings you have and not me. <laughs> and Emily, my youngest, will be graduating from UC Berkeley in six weeks. As uh, must be absolutely obvious to everyone here, I am also an accomplished <laughs> bodybuilder. <laughs> Dr. Schumann has nothing on me. And in my spare time, I enjoy working out vigorously with my wiener dog, Schnitzel. <laughs> my first story is called, Dying is No Laughing Matter. I was Harold's doctor for over 20 years, and I knew him very well. He spent his entire career as a psychologist, but unfortunately, when he got to his late 70s, Harold developed severe congestive heart failure, which means that the heart no longer could effectively pump the blood to his vital organs. Although he always remained intellectually sharp and talkative, he could barely walk five steps without being severely short of breath. Tragically, he suffered a heart attack and was taken awake to the coronary care unit. There he had a stormy hospital course. One sad morning at 11 o'clock, I was called urgently from the coronary care unit from my office because the CCU nurse found him unconscious, without a pulse, without a blood pressure, not breathing. In other words, he was dying. As I ran across the street to the CCU, I actually remembered speaking with him only three hours earlier while I was on rounds, and I felt really sad about losing this longtime friend and patient. When I got to the CCU, Harold was not moving. He had no pulse. He had no blood pressure. He was not breathing. His wife and two daughters were crying loudly at the bedside. I put my stethoscope on his chest, but unfortunately I heard nothing. No heart rate, no pulse, no breathing. I checked his blood pressure with a cuff. There was none. It had been over eight and a half minutes since the nurse called me, and I knew it was over. I turned to the family, and frankly, in my most sober and professional voice, I said, I'm so sorry to have to tell you this, but our beautiful dear friend Harold is, and I was going to say, is dead, except at that very second, Harold sat up in the bed. <laughs> Harold winked at me and said, quote, our dear Harold is not dead yet. <laughs> to say I was stunned was somewhat of an understatement. 
For 25 years in my professional career, I have had the sacred professional duty to pronounce hundreds of people dead. And up until that moment, if I said you were dead, then you were dead. <laughs> Except for Harold. After 20 minutes, I asked the family to please wait outside so I could examine Harold. That was a ruse. When they were gone, I sat down on Harold's bed and I said, okay, talk to me, what is going on? Harold said he felt me inflating the blood pressure cuff on his arm and he knew from knowing me for 20 years what I was gonna say. He thought it would be funny if he waited to say something just at the right time because he thought it would punk me. <laughs> nice timing, I said. But honestly, I said to Harold, Harold, my dear friend, you were what we call dead. The nurse, the respiratory therapist, and me all saw the same thing. The machines all were a flat line. You had no pulse and no breathing. But enough of this medical stuff. Would you mind telling me what it was like? Did you see, let's say, beautiful gates? And maybe somebody opened it and there was like somebody sitting on a throne with angels around them? Or did you see a tunnel with bright lights at the back? Uh, did you see relatives that were long lost gone, or maybe George Washington? Would you just me please tell me what, what was it like? Always the psychologist, which he was, Harold reminded me that nobody knows anything about death. Then he said, let me tell you what death is like. No, there were no bright lights, there were no angels, I saw no George Washington. What he did said, however, I have never forgotten to this day. He said, remember when you were a young kid and you played so hard and so long that you fell into the deepest of sleeps, no dreams, no movement, your mind was quiet and not racing. That's what it was like. He called it, quote, the best sleep of my life. He called it peaceful, calm, and wonderful. We sat for a while longer, then I let back in his family and I went back to my office. Three hours later, the nurse called me and said, Harold had no pulse, no blood pressure, and no breathing. This time, I very quietly and carefully hung up the phone. I apologized to my waiting patients. I had a glass of water. I walked quickly across the street, but not ran, and I went to examine Harold for 10 minutes. I checked his pulse. I checked his blood pressure. I checked his heart rate. I checked his pulse. I checked his blood pressure. <laughs> I checked his heart rate. I did this for 10 minutes. I have never done that for more than once. Finally, I turned to his family and I said, our dear Harold, Harold, your dad, and I looked at his children, Harold, your wonderful husband, I looked at Harold and his wife, Harold, a great psychologist, nothing, he didn't move, Harold, my dear patient, our dear Harold, finally, sadly, is now dead. And I turned to Harold, and the final thing I said to him was, rest in peace. A few months ago, I was called to admit a patient from the emergency department one evening for constipation. I introduced myself to the woman and began to ask her the history of her illness. She explained her condition to me and, and what ultimately brought her into the emergency department. She hadn't had a bowel movement in over a week. She explained her condition, how painful it was, and why she finally decided to come in. After a very long conversation, she looked at me and said, now when's the real doctor coming in? <laughs> I explained to her that I was a real doctor, <laughs> and I'd be the one taking care of her as well as my attending. And then I asked her who she thought I was when she explained to me lots of personal details about her life and her constipation. Her response, a candy striper. <laughs> I laughed with her and explained that I kind of get that all the time. And due to my age, it's okay. 
Um, but I was intrigued why in the world she told her whole life story to someone who she thought was a hospital volunteer. Her response, I just thought you were nosy. <laughs> so I began working up the patient for constipation, ordered some labs, got some imaging, and after a few hours, we determined that she had a fatal cancer that was causing her constipation. The second day of her admission, I had to walk into her room and give her the information that the constipation was not just constipation, but a symptom of a fatal cancer. I walked in and greeted her, and she greeted me with, hi, Candy Striper, <laughs> which she called me throughout her hospital stay, which always brought a smile to my face. A little reminder of the humanity and the humility of our first meeting. I sat down and I explained to her her illness and tried to help her come to the realization of the severity of it and that she was nearing the end of her life. After I told her, she was silent. Her first words to me were that she did not want to burden her family, especially her daughters, with this information. She wanted to appear as the strong mother that she had always been to them and she didn't want to show them that her body was failing her. I encouraged her to have an open discussion, as any good candy striper would do. Throughout the next few days and the mornings on rounds, she continuously told me she was fine and she had no complaints. However, throughout the day, I was constantly paged that she was having a variety of issues. Hunger, nausea, headaches, constipation. None of the medication I was giving her was helping. And I was constantly wondering what I was missing from this equation. Was there more testing that I needed to do? Another image that needed to be taken? I felt like something was missing, especially since in the morning rounds, she was totally fine, but by the afternoon, I had multiple pages on her behalf. On her third hospital day, I was paged three times in a row for various ailments, so I decided to go and see her after my lunch lecture. I walked up to her room and sat down next to her. I asked her what was going on, since in the morning, she says that she's totally fine, but by the afternoon, she has a lot of issues. She finally told me that she was embellishing her issues so that I would come and see her. She was at the end of her life and she was having lots of questions about what to do next and where to go from here. She was worried that she had not done enough in her life. She was worried about her daughters since they had a weekly schedule of calling her. She was worried about the routines that she had and she discussed all of her weaknesses that she was feeling. She thought that she hadn't done enough in her 90 plus years on this earth and that there was something that she was always unable to achieve. This woman who had a family, was a published author, and lived a very long life was looking to me, her candy striper, in the last moments of her life. In the moment I realized that being a doctor wasn't a test that I could order or an image modality that I could get or a medication I could give. It was being able to sit down and talk with her. I would not be able to heal this patient, but I could take a few minutes out of my day and sit with her and listen. I could be there on her journey of her last step. Here I was, her candy striper, whom she confided her symptoms in just a few days before of her constipation, and now was sharing the largest worries that she had about death. We talked for over an hour about what she did accomplish in her life her family, and the things that she did not have time for. On her fourth hospital stay, her journey ended and she died, but she left a lasting impression on me that I will never forget. She taught me that sometimes the best doctor isn't ordering more labs or tests, but being a candy striper. To remove the white coat and the worries about schedules, things that we need to get to, and sit down and listen to our patients, if only for a moment. I hope to continue to bring this candy striper mentality into my career, to take some time out and listen to my patients. Especially when a cure is not possible, I can still care. And sometimes that one letter difference makes all the difference. So my second story is sort of in two parts, but our format is one story to each doctor and then you gotta give up the podium and the next doctor comes up. So you're gonna have to remember this story until 
<laughs> later. And it, it, the subject is uh, another cheerful one, blood. Um, I had done my residency in uh, family practice in the late 60s, and I was in practice for the, in the military as well as in uh, Santa Paula for a total of seven years. Now I went back into my surgical residency and I came back a full-fledged surgeon and I felt very good about myself. I thought I knew everything. Uh, I felt very confident. I'd gotten very good grades on all my exams. And uh, one morning I walked through, actually it was the afternoon, uh, now that I think about it, in the afternoon, I walked through the uh, OR, and in the hall between the operating rooms, there was a friend of mine, a fellow surgeon. He looked pale, sweaty, nervous. He grabbed me and he says, I need your help right away. I have a patient that's bleeding to death, and I've got a, I operated her in the morning, and she's, something's very wrong. Uh, we got to take another look. I did not know this patient. In the course of time, as we were going through this, I did learn that she was 35 years old. She was a mother of five, and she was dying. Uh, so she was brought back to the operating from the recovery room. Uh, blood pressure was very low. Pulse was very high. She was not with it. Uh, the anesthesiologist hardly had to do anything to put her to sleep. A couple of whiffs of gas and she was out. Uh, the belly was painted with iodine and uh, the previous incision made in the morning was opened up. Immediately, a couple of gallons of, uh, not, not gall maybe one gallon of blood spilled out on the floor, on the drapes. Uh, it was impressive. We found the bleeding vessel, we cleaned out all the blood, and the artery, there was a big artery, the uterine artery, that was bleeding sort of like uh, cherry water. Uh, the surgeon controlled it with a couple of stitches, and I thought, well, where's the blood? We're going to give her blood, right? No, we can't. She's a Jehovah's Witness. We're going to let her die. Her hemoglobin, normally hemoglobin is like 13 to 15. Her hemoglobin was two. That is not compatible with life. And I looked at everybody. And we're not going to just sit here, are we? No. I took my gloves off. I knew this hospital very well. I had done my previous residency there. I knew where the blood bank was. I knew where the refrigerator had all the O-negative blood in it. I says, I know how to solve this problem. I ran down to the uh, blood bank, picked up all the O-negative, that's the universal donor that everyone can take, about five units worth, ran back to the OR, and started giving it. But before you give it, you gotta check it. There's always, the big problem with blood is you can give the wrong blood to the wrong person, and that causes the reaction where they can die from that. So usually it takes two people, not usually, it, you must have two people, check the blood. No one would check it with me. We can't, we can't do it. The anesthesiologist said, she's always witness, you can't do this. The surgeon was sort of in a daze, he didn't say anything, he was just standing there. The nurses, they were terrified, horrified. You can't do this, but nobody stopped me. They could have, but they didn't. And I started to pull the thing apart and, and hang it up and pump it in. And like a miracle, her blood pressure came back. The EKG, which, had, which is supposed to be a narrow little peak, was like a wave. And that started to narrow. And she became alive again. Now, I'd given her five units, and things looked pretty good. Uh, now the anesthesiologist was happy, but not happy at me because I had done something bad. And I got the feeling from everybody around me that I probably didn't do the right thing. But I thought I did. Uh, 
I wanted to keep her in the operating room so we could give her more blood because she needed more blood. But everybody voted against me and the surgeon closed her up and she was taken to the intensive care unit where immediately her bed was ringed by the family, all Jehovah's Witnesses, her minister, and some of the congregation. And they knew that what I had done. They had seen it because all they needed to do was the discoloration of the plastic tubing, which was red. So she got blood. And they were horrified. I had condemned her to everlasting death by doing this. Uh, they were mad at me. So this was not my patient, but yet I saw her every day. And when I came in, the same group ringed the bed that had ringed her the day of the surgery. And I, I felt like the villain, you know. If, if they could have hissed, they would have. I think there was a boo here and there. Uh, but you know what? I looked at her, and she smiled. And I knew that I was okay. But they wanted literally blood. <laughs> they wanted blood. They wanted me somehow punished. Now, in those days, uh, doctors had not successfully been sued for giving blood to a Jehovah's Witness. Now, that is no longer true. Doctors have been sued and have lost. So, but in those days, you could do those things and get away with it without getting sued. So that was out for them, but they wanted some kind of a reprimand. And indeed, they went to the hospital administration and demanded a letter that would fire me. Well, they didn't fire me, but they did write me a letter. I never, uh, and it went into, you know that file that follows you from grade school, the permanent file? <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it went into that file, and it's followed me all my life. Now, I am very proud of that letter. So keep that story in mind because I did exactly the opposite thing on the next story and still got into trouble. <laughs> so as Dr. Hornstein mentioned, I'm a bit of an overachiever. But still, with my good grades, I entered my residency, as everyone does, incredibly terrified, certain that I knew nothing. My fellow on my first day told me to write a patient for an anti-cough dose of Tylenol, and I thought, I had no idea Tylenol did that. Of course, she had just misspoken. So I was certain I knew absolutely nothing. But through my training, through my three years, by the time I entered my final year of my residency, I was pretty certain that I had learned everything I needed to know to go out into the world and start being a doctor. I knew there was more to learn in general, but I knew I'm ready. I've got the skills, I've got the tools. I've got senioritis, let me loose. Of course, it turns out that there are always more lessons to learn. Uh, on this particular night, I was doing a rotation in the pediatric intensive care unit. And just as it is for adults, this is where the sickest of the sick children go. Children who need to be on breathing machines, uh, children with cancer who are dying or who have had very large surgeries. And I like the pediatric ICU, as Dr. Hornstein mentioned, I did a fellowship in it. And I was there with my supervising doctor as we got a call for a new admission. This was an eight-year-old little boy. He had been previously 100% healthy, the healthiest little boy you could imagine. About four or five days before coming to us, he'd been at home playing with his brother, and he had bumped his hip on a counter or a table and had developed an infection from that in his hip joint. He had been admitted to the hospital in one of the other boroughs of New York to a regular pediatric floor. And over the subsequent two to three days, that infection spread. 
and the bacteria in his hip joint got into his bloodstream and now was making him incredibly ill. By the time he got to our ICU, he was on maximal life support. He was so cold because he, his blood pressure was so low, you actually couldn't tell he was alive. He had no pulses you could feel because his blood vessels were so tight, because he was dying. We brought him into the room and began setting him up in his hospital bed. His family obviously came to join him. His father had emigrated here from Nigeria to give his children and his family a better life. And I sat at my computer entering his information. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see at the bedside were our two nurses preparing his bed and changing the bedclothes. And next to our two nurses, was his father. As the nurses changed the bedclothes, they would put the dirty clothing to the side, the dirty sheets, and I would see the father with every placement jump like a grasshopper, grab it, run to the laundry, dump it in the laundry, and run back to his station next to the nurses. And I thought to myself, well, that's ridiculous. He doesn't need to do that. We have nurses doing that. There are moments in life, as I'm sure you all know, where you have a moment of clarity, where the true nature of what something means becomes clear to you, and you realize you're an idiot. And I realized, oh my goodness, this father's not doing this because we need him to. He's doing this because that is his son. And what more does a parent want in life than to protect their child and heal them and make them well and keep them safe? And right now, he can't do that. He feels helpless. The only thing he has at his fingertips is to grab that dirty laundry and put it in that wastebasket. That is how he is trying to help his child because it is all that he has available to him. And I began to realize something that, of course, was not in any of my books that I had never been tested on. And that was that when a parent brings their child to me as a pediatrician, they are turning over to me this gigantic responsibility. They are turning over to me the one thing in life they want to do. I want to heal my child and keep them safe, make them better, and I cannot. And so I am entrusting you, doctor, to do that in my stead. And I realized, yes, it is imperative that I give good medical care. But it was equally important that I realize not just the responsibility that they were turning over to me, but the honor that they were turning over to me, that it was sacred to turn that over to me and ask me to be that loving parent in their stead, to be the doctor they would be to their child if they could be that doctor. I don't know that that father will ever realize what an impact that had on me that day. It has changed my practice forever. I will always remember what a sacred responsibility it is to be able to do that, to be given that responsibility by a parent for every child that I care for. Thank you. My second story is called, Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. 
So during my residency, two senior residents covered the emergency room at night, meaning at 10 o'clock at night, all of the normal faculty and the bright people left, and two senior residents were left to deal with the 11 o'clock to 8 o'clock patients who came in. My fellow resident, Jeff, which is, of course, not his name, and I were talking in the doctor's room around 11, I'm sorry, around 3 a.m. when two patients arrived by ambulance. One was a patient apparently very intoxicated because the bars had closed, and he was brought in by the police to be medically cleared before they were going to take him to jail. The other patient was mine. I'll call him Alan. Alan was a 22-year-old man who was suffering from a full-on panic attack. He was having the worst anxiety attack I had ever seen. Now, the emergency room was small, and I can hear Jeff, my colleague, through the curtain speaking to the drunk man with the police officer present. I spoke in a calm voice with Alan, who was sweating and breathing fast and extremely agitated. He said that for the past two weeks, he could not calm down, and he was convinced something terrible was going to happen to him. His private doctor in the community had prescribed him a Valium-like drug, a tranquilizer, which calmed him down temporarily, but when it wore off, he became panicked again. I did an exam and did some lab tests, all of which were normal, and I reassured him again at the bedside that he was now safe. He was in the ER and that I would be able to give him something to calm him down and make him comfortable. He looked at me, and, and frankly, he looked skeptical, but I gave him my most reassuring look and a firm pat on his arm. And just as I was turning away, I heard my fellow resident Jeff yell, gun, everybody get down. Now, I later learned that the alcoholic patient, after he was cleared to go to jail, was actually not happy with that plan. So instead, he knocked over the policeman and grabbed his service revolver. I was still by my patient's side when I heard the gun go off, and I heard the bullet ricochet around this very small emergency room. Bing, 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 bing. And I turned around to look at Alan just as the bullet struck his right shoulder. Now, in the second before he screamed, and before I reached for some gauze, I saw him look at me, and without saying a word, I think he said, see? <laughs> I told you something bad was going to happen. Now do you believe me? Sometimes in medicine, we are fortunate to cure patients, as one of my colleagues said. Sometimes we cannot cure, but we are able to manage illness. And even some other times, the best we can do is just stand by one another person and simply acknowledge their suffering from some of the frankly unexplainable aspects of the craziness of life. I never left Alan's side as they got him ready for surgery. Finally, the best I could say was, I'm sorry, Alan, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to personally wheel you into the operating room. He nodded it was okay, and we went down that somewhat darkened hallway at 5 o'clock in the morning, and oddly he seemed less anxious, and I wondered to myself if in fact there was enough Valium in the hospital for both of us. <laughs> During my medical school rotations, I was fortunate enough to spend a few months at a center in LA that is world renowned in the care of para and quadriplegic patients. Before I started that rotation, I thought that there were a few things worse in life than para or quadriplegia. In my own judgment, I thought that not being able to do anything for yourself and having to care and depend on somebody else to do everything for you day to day was nothing more than a burden. I had a preconceived notion of what life was and what gave it meaning. 
However, that all changed when I met Jimmy. Jimmy had a very tragic few years prior to me meeting him. He was young and in love a few years before I met him. He fell in love fast with a woman he had known for only a few months. He decided that she was the one, and on their four-month anniversary, he proposed. His girlfriend was afraid of how strong his feelings were so fast in their relationship that she rejected his proposal and instead broke up with him. Now, how many of us in this room have ever been broken up with before? Anyone? Anyone want to raise their hands? <laughs> okay, good. So you know exactly how Jimmy felt in that moment. He was feeling down, out, and he didn't see a light. So what many of us will maybe drown in a pint of ice cream or a gallon, he took this pain and did something else with it. He decided that he wanted to commit suicide and tried to jump out of a second story window head first. Unfortunately, the fall did not kill him. It left him quadriplegic. He was paralyzed from the neck down. He was unable to care for himself and his mother became his everything. She had to do the simplest tasks and everyday things for him. Necessities that Jimmy could no longer do himself. She took care of him for four years until it was too much for her. And instead of bringing him home from his doctor's appointment that day, she left him at the hospital. She never came back for him. She abandoned him. The hospital took pity on him and decided to let him stay at the facility and work as a spiritual advisor. Now, I felt so sorry for this man before I ever met him. He was handed a very short stick in life. I pitied him just because of his physical limitations. But however, it did not affect his ability to connect with others. I began witnessing his spiritual sessions in which he would come up to patients' rooms who were, nearly, who were newly excuse me, paralyzed and talk with them, explain to him the things that had changed for him and the things that got better. He told them that there was other things to look forward to in life and that these firsthand experiences completely changed these new patients' outcomes. He <clears throat> became so vital for this hospital that I began to consult him on patients as well. He became my mentor for taking care of patients that were severely physically disabled. He taught me that disability is in the eye of the beholder and not to be swayed by my own bias and beliefs of what it must be like to be paralyzed. Jimmy was able to help countless people with the knowledge and realization that disabilities do not define him. He reminded me that even a patient who cannot be healed of their ailment is still a human and that their interaction and growth is still there. Jimmy is now setting for his GED and he's hoping to one day become a social worker. He found greater meaning in his life through his disability than he ever would have without it. He helped me realize to not let my preconceived notions of what meaningful life is to burden my patients. Anyone can find meaning if they look for it. With this new outlook, I am better prepared to help and treat patients of all different abilities and disabilities and keep an open mind and I have Jimmy to thank for that. So for my last story, you'll remember the previous story where I got in trouble by giving blood to a Jehovah's Witness and got a letter of reprimand that has been following me ever since in my permanent file since first grade. Now, the second story is related in that I'm also dealing with the Jehovah's Witness. And I, I've had a fair experience with Jehovah's Witness. Santa Paula in Fillmore, where I practiced, has an enclave of, of JWs. And uh, I became fairly familiar with them, and I was not afraid to operate on them. And I, I promised them no blood uh, after my sin of giving blood. But uh, I kept that promise, and most of the time I, I was able to do that very well, and I never gave blood again. Besides, doctors started getting sued and lose cases where they gave blood. 
So that made me think twice. But I did various techniques, uh, hemodilution where you uh, bleed the patient uh, with, with a bottle on the floor, but the tubing is still connected, and they would accept that. That is, as long as the blood was not disconnected from the body, they would accept it back. But if you disconnected the tubing, that was bad. I, I, I took care of numerous Jehovah's Witnesses without an incident. Uh, so the next patient I saw, and that was just a, f a few years ago, and uh, most of the stories that I've told so far are in my book, but this one isn't because it happens recently. Uh, he had an obstructed colon from a benign tumor. Uh, and I was going to take out that section of colon and put it back together again. And we did it uh, laparoscopically with little tiny incisions, and it went beautifully. There was no bleeding. I had another surgeon with me. In fact, the surgeon had referred that case to me because he didn't do the robotic laparoscopic technique, and he thought a Jehovah's Witness would uh, do better with that because there are no big incisions, less surface to bleed, and it went just fine. Uh, finished the operation. I went out to the family to tell them that things were great. About 10 minutes, I get a call from the nurse. You better come back. He's not doing well. So I hobbled back. I had a knee injury, and I, I didn't run. I hobbled. Uh, and I actually timed my, later I found out how long it took me to hobble because that became a, an issue at the trial, how long it took me to get back. So uh, I got back in about three and a half minutes. I had a worried concern that he's got to be bleeding somewhere. The anesthesiologist disagreed with me. He said his heart rate is slow and his blood pressure is low. He had a heart attack. And you want to operate on him? He's had a heart attack. He'll die. And I thought, eh, I don't know. If he's bleeding from somewhere, I've got one chance, and that chance is now. I prevailed, and we put him back on the operating table. I opened him up, and there was, you know, 3,000 cc's of blood, three pints of blood, more than half his blood volume in his abdomen. Found the bleeding site, controlled it. Uh, he was uh, still in bad shape. His blood pressure was still very low. We took him up to the intensive care unit. I did not give blood. And we uh, nursed him back to where he was going to look like he's going to survive. He had about every complication known to man. Uh, he had uh, the junction where the colon was put together didn't heal because he had no blood to heal it. You need blood to heal it. So his, that fell apart. So then he needed the colostomy. His kidneys didn't get any blood, so they failed. His lungs failed. He needed the tracheotomy. But slowly and surely, he got better. We gave him what the Jehovah's Witnesses consider the holy grail of uh, sub blood substitute is epigen, uh, which takes a month to work. So <laughs> it didn't do a whole lot initially. But eventually, he did OK. So I was very proud of this, because he eventually survived. And actually, in a, a year, he was back to normal. His colostomy was reversed. The tracheotomy was out. His kidneys had recovered, and I thought I was going to get cookies. Instead, I got a lawsuit, and we went to court, and uh, it was a two-year ordeal during which my wife tells me I was really grumpy. <laughs> you know, deposition after deposition, and you know, lawsuits are pretty personal to doctors. You know, they say don't take it personally. It is personal. Somebody's calling you a failure. Somebody's calling you that you screwed up. And that's hard to take. That's a personal thing. Uh, so anyway, I, we went to court, and parts of the issues was how long it took me to get back. Well, it took me a total of 18 minutes to get back in the belly, which his witness, his expert witness, a surgeon, a Jehovah's Witness surgeon, said was too long. Even though it took me a little longer to get back because of my bum knee, even though I had to argue with the anesthesiologist, even though I had to start special IVs to give him large volume of fluid, even though it took another two, three minutes to put him back on the, on, from the gurney to the operating table. Uh, 
It was too long, he said. So it went to court. After two years, $80,000 and lots of grief. And uh, my wife said, don't ever touch another Jehovah's Witness or I will divorce you. <laughs> so the first day in court, I won. The judge threw it out. Not a case. So since then, no more JWs. <laughs> Do you want to see that for a while? <laughs> I could have brought pictures of me lifting. Um, so I came to Ventura in 2008, um, and I practice both hospital pediatrics, as Dr. Hornstein mentioned, and then I also have an outpatient general pediatric practice through the Centers for Family Health in Oxnard. And I developed a reputation, I guess, as a doctor who was comfortable with children who had multiple medical conditions or complex medical conditions. And so through the years, uh, I have filtered a number of these children into my practice. About four years ago, a little boy started to come to my office to see me. He had been diagnosed with a very severe heart anomaly after he was born. This particular abnormality requires at a minimum three open heart surgeries for a child to have any chance of survival. When I met him, he'd had one, and we knew he had two more down the line. Children who have this specific heart anomaly live with the sword of Damocles hanging over their head. No day is guaranteed. We all are born, we all live, we assume we have a certain number of days that are sort of a given. But for children like this young boy, none of those days are a definite. Based on the lesson that I learned from that father in New York, most of the parents of my chronically ill children have my phone number so that if the child has an illness, if they're having any problems, the parents can access me, whether it's just for comfort, reassurance, or sometimes for a real problem that needs to be managed. One evening, about two in the morning, I'm happily sleeping my night away, and a message comes in from the parents of this young boy. He had already been through an episode where he progressed to his second surgery and the way they realized he needed his second surgery was that he went down to Children's Hospital of Los Angeles for a fever and turned blue as he was leaving the emergency room because his oxygen levels were so low that he was no longer able to be pink. They admitted him, performed his second surgery, and he spent many weeks in the hospital after his operation having complications that are common after the surgery. He specifically kept accumulating fluid inside his lungs. He had been home for about one week, and the parents messaged me to tell me something's not right. He's breathing very quickly, his oxygen levels are low. We don't know what to do. I groggily messaged them back, meet me in the emergency room, because I knew that this child's cardiac issues were more than any emergency room physician who's not well-versed in them would be comfortable managing. I met the parents in the emergency room, and they were distraught, understandably. As we sat waiting for an x-ray of his chest to see if the fluid had returned, his mother began crying on my shoulder. This was their first child. He was not diagnosed prenatally, so the ultrasounds did not show his cardiac abnormality. They had spent eight months of a pregnancy excited about the prospects of this life that was going to come to them. 
Now he's here and they love him, but it is not the joy that they were expecting. Every day is terror. The smallest cold can kill him. The mom cries on my shoulder and tells me, it's like we don't get to be parents. We don't get to look forward to when he rolls over or his first food or what he's going to do tomorrow like a baby. We're just terrified he's going to die. We're at home being nurses. This is not what I expected. I sat with them in the emergency room. We found out what was going on with him and we began to treat it. And I sat with the parents for a number of hours explaining what we were gonna do, how we were gonna manage this, what we were going to do the next day and the next day. And the mom looked at me and she said, you know, it's 4.30 in the morning. I know you have to be at your office tomorrow. You must be exhausted. You should go home. I don't really know why you're here. I mean, we figured it out. We're treating him. It's, it's okay. And I looked at her and I said, I understand that I get to clock out from this problem. When I leave here, I can go home and I can blissfully fall back asleep if I want to. If tomorrow is a Saturday and I'm not working, I can go out and I can enjoy myself. I can clock out of these problems if I need to. But you don't get to do that. This is your life 24-7. You don't get to clock out. You live with this even when I go home. So I'll spend as much time as I need to with you to make you feel better because at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's about you, it's about your child. I'm sure the mother appreciated me being there. I know she did. But I appreciate so much more the perspective that I've learned from my patients to know what's really important. And it's not the sleep that I could have gotten. It's not the relaxation or the time at home. It's the chance to help a parent through that thing that they can't walk away from because that is their life. My last story is called, Why Do Patients Lie? <laughs> now, part of my family medicine training was to deliver babies, to do obstetrics. And one of my first pregnancies, which I managed alone, belonged to Alice. Alice was a 26-year-old single woman. It was her first pregnancy, and frankly, mine too. At her first visit, at our first visit, we talked about vitamins, we talked about exercise, we talked about healthy eating. And I just should tell you, before Alice got pregnant at this first visit, she was a completely normal, healthy woman with a healthy weight of 125 pounds, and she was five foot four. So you would agree with me, she was a pretty healthy person, right? Okay. After one month, Alice came back and had a 14 pound weight gain in one month. Now, I was concerned because Alice said she was nauseated and that the food settled her stomach, which made sense to me. So we went back and talked about the normal pregnancy weight for a normal pregnancy is about 25-ish pounds, 25 to 30. So we talked about good food choices and avoiding junk food, and Alice said, I'll do better. The next month, Alice returned with a 10-pound additional weight gain. It's now 24 pounds in two months. She said she ate very little, and it was probably water weight. And I said, water weight? I don't know what that is, but that sounds reasonable. <laughs> so we had another talk about good diet and exercise, and I said, watch the water weight, whatever that was, <laughs> and I will see you back in a month. She came in next month. She gained another 10 pounds. This time, I became worried. And I checked her for diabetes and thyroid disease and anemia, and all the tests were normal. And I actually turned to my OBGYN teacher, and I said, I'm so sorry, would you please examine her, which he did. And he said, everything looked fine. She just needed to eat a little less, and we'll see her in a month. Well, you know the rest. Next month she came in, she had gained 12 pounds. She's now at 46 pounds. 
And I was very worried because I thought she had a tumor or a mass. And so we sent her to a local endocrinologist who did a normal exam. And then I sent her to a dietitian who said she's fine. She just needs to exercise a little more. They did advise me to see her every two weeks instead of every four weeks, which I thought was a good idea. Two weeks later, I saw her. Her weight was up seven pounds in two weeks. She was now at 53 pounds. She was halfway through a pregnancy. And I sent her to UCLA to the high-risk clinic saying something must be terribly wrong. They did all sorts of tests without a diagnosis. I then had her come back and I did what any other physician would do and sent her to Cedar sinai <laughs> where they examined her and said, beats me. We can't find what it was. So this went on throughout her entire pregnancy with myself, my OBGYN attending, two endocrinologists, UCLA and Cedar sinai all watching her. By the time she got to term at nine months, Alice had gained 125 pounds, which I would like to have you recall was double her body weight. So she went from 125 to 250 pounds. During her labor, which I managed, because of her size, it confounded her delivery. And unfortunately, we needed to do a C-section, which uh, Dr. Wasiak can only imagine was extremely complicated because of all the problems with her weight. She also had a complicated post-op course. Finally, however, she left, and I saw her at her six-week postpartum visit. Her exam was normal, other than she still weighed 120 pounds over her pre-pregnancy weight. And I started to talk to her about diet and exercise and weight loss when Alice simply sat down and started crying, and she couldn't stop. And I turned to her and I said, what? What's going on? And she said she was so sorry, so sorry about lying to me. And I said, about what? And she said that she admitted from the beginning of her pregnancy, she would eat, and I'm quoting, anything that didn't move. <laughs> Sometimes, she said, she ate entire pies, Cakes, milkshakes, McDonald's, and McDLTs. Now, I was stunned, and I was young, and I asked her why she lied to me and all the other doctors for over nine months. And the reason she said has stuck with me to this day. She said the reason was really simple. She lied to me because of me. She said from the very beginning, it was so clear to her that I was trying so hard to be such a good young doctor that she couldn't stand the fact that I was failing and that she simply liked to eat. <laughs> she couldn't tell me that, so she said, I seem so conscientious that I would find the right answer. As time went on, I looked so determined to find the medical correct diagnosis that she never had the heart to embarrass me in front of my attendings, in front of all the specialists, in front of the super specialists, and in front of Cedar sinai <laughs> She said, everybody, including you, were so nice. I just didn't have the heart. <laughs> so what did I learn from Alice? I learned that the doctor-patient relationship really is a relationship. And like all relationships, people sometimes do things to protect the feelings of others. So let me just say this unequivocally. To all of you out there who are currently not being totally honest with your doctors in an effort to protect their feelings, I say on behalf of all of medicine, thank you for your concern and sensitivity. Now please knock it off. <laughs> Honestly, a simple thank you note will work just as well. Now, our time is running late. We were going to go to the lightning round. Uh, I think that, uh, well, let me ask you. We have four questions. Can I ask one? And then uh, is that, would that be okay? All right. 
So our turn to our panel, so we have several. Why don't we end on this because it's kind of a happy note. Um, so I'd like to turn to our four uh, panelists for our last question. And I'd like you to tell me your funniest experience in medicine. Dr. Vinson? So I was doing a rotation in Dayton, Ohio, which no one wants to go there ever. <laughs> I didn't want to go there either. But my beautiful fiance is from Ohio, and I told him that I would spend a month there, and I never want to go back. <laughs> so it was in the middle of the night in the emergency department, and this man came in for abdominal pain. And so as a medical student, our favorite job that we get to do is a rectal exam. <laughs> Every patient that comes in with abdominal pain usually gets a rectal exam. So I'm asking him his history and what was going on and when it started. It started a few hours before. I do my physical exam, do my abdominal exam, and then I tell him that I have to do a rectal exam. And I always tell patients it's not my favorite part of my job either, because it's not. So I go to do a rectal exam, and as he turns to his side, I see something coming out of his rectum. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, that is a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so as many people who know me realize that I don't really have a filter and so I just asked him why is there a vegetable in your anus and his response was oh I was gardening <laughs> and I fell and that must be why it's in there and I said I don't know why you were gardening in the metropolis of Dayton, Ohio, in the middle of the night, naked, and <laughs> fell. So then I had to call up uh, one of the surgery attendings and explain to him what was going on, and he came and, take the, and took the patient. But the best part of the story is once the, the vegetable was removed, there was still a, those little stickers that you get from the grocery <laughs> store. <laughs> <laughs> it was still on there. So I don't think that he has that in his garden. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Schumann. Okay, so I get hopefully my story won't seem offensive after the butt story. <laughs> okay, we're so, all friends here, aren't yes. we? Yes. The, it's 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 the funniest thing that's ever happened to me. So I was doing residency in New York. And I had this mother who brought, had met me in the emergency room and brought, decided to bring her children to see me in my residency-based clinic. She was from the Caribbean, and so she had the strong Caribbean accent, strong woman, mother, head of household. And she brings her 13-year-old son to me for a physical. And the first thing she says when I walk in the room is, I say, oh, hi, how are you, how's everything? Dr. Schumann, I was going to beat Kevin with a stick today, but I knew I was coming to see you. <laughs> okay, well, what, what happened? Well, I woke up this morning, Dr. Schumann, I be calling him, Kevin, Kevin, he's not answering me. So, I keep calling, Kevin, Kevin, he no answer. I go up the stairs, I knocking on the door, Kevin, Kevin, he no answer me. So, I open the door. He in there, Dr. Schumann, he's whacking dotting. <laughs> he's got stuff all over his hands. I was going to beat him, but I knew I was coming to see you today. She then proceeds to hand me all of his pornography <laughs> that she had brought from his bedroom that she had found. And so I, as the professional physician, very calmly, because I can't just say it's normal without looking and looking like I'm looking, page <laughs> through it, hand it back to her and say, this all looks very normal. Kevin, in the future, when your mother calls you, you need to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Owasiak. So I was, uh, I was in the Air Force during Vietnam. And I was stationed, not, luckily not in Vietnam, but in Europe, uh, actually off 
uh, and the Azores, which is a set of islands off Portugal, belongs to Portugal. Uh, we, had, we had a small hospital, uh, a base of about 4,000 soldiers. Uh, nobody ever really got sick. Uh, we had an emergency room, and we all took turns, seven doctors, taking call. Nothing was happening. The ambulance was never used, hardly. And the, the two corpsmen that did most of the work, I usually just sat there and read journals or something, uh, the two corpsmen wanted to get pizza. And, oh, sure, go get pizza. They took the ambulance. <laughs> I manned the phones. No sooner had they left, I get a call from base ops, which is our, head, our nerve center and also the airport for the uh, job. We really were there to do the, to uh, watch the Russian North, Amer North Atlantic fleet. I get a call from base ops that there was a cardiac arrest in the airport. And I had just sent the ambulance away for pizza. So I, I you know, I, I saw the court martial unfolding before me. Not only that, but somebody was dying and I had no means to get there. Well, I did have a car. My uh, father-in-law gave us a uh, VW Green Bug that we managed to haul to the Azores. And I took that with a bag, with an emergency bag, ran to base ops, or drove to base ops quickly, ran in. And there was a cluster of people gathered around the body. And I, you know, I just, oh, horrible. I had to fight my way into the crowd because they were, you know, very dense. But I was the guy in charge, you know, so I had to see what was going on. And there was a man giving mouth to mouth to a woman that was lying down on the floor, blood trickling down one corner of her mouth. And I thought, worst case scenario, this is awful. Young looking woman. I managed to get the man away so that I could examine her and immediately knew I was safe. She had a, some kind of a hysterical panic anxiety attack that the man who was giving her mouth to mouth interpreted as a seizure. He proceeded somewhere, as I later found out, because somewhere he had learned in some misguided first aid course that you have to protect the tongue from being bitten by a person having seizures. So he had nothing except his shoe. <laughs> so he shoved his shoe in her mouth. She was fighting him, but he thought that was just more of a seizure, you know? And so he kept, and he lacerated her lip. That's where the blood came from. So, so by that time, you know, I, I said, oh, great, you know, I, I, no court martial, I'm safe. So. By that time, the two guys that were off getting pizza had heard, there was a small base, things travel fast. Uh, they, uh, they, sat, they came with the ambulance and we extricated ourselves by taking the body <laughs> onto the ambulance, you know, and taking her up to the hospital, uh, where I sat with her a while until she calmed down, sewed up her little cut that she had, gave her a tetanus shot, and <laughs> sent her home. And I thought, well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> got out of that one, you know. <laughs> Week later, I get a call from headquarters. The general wants to see you at 1 p.m. Uh, they caught me, you know. I, I'm, I'm finished. My career is over. I'm going to jail, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, I, you know, with great trepidation, I went to the headquarters and uh, the, the guy that was doing the shoe thing, he was, he was a captain, he was there too. And they were all smiling. And I was, what is going on here? Well, it was a celebration because we were go both being decorated as heroes for saving this woman's life. <laughs> now, I couldn't, I couldn't say anything because if I did, they would, you know, I'd have to tell them about the pizza. <laughs> so, me and the captain became heroes <laughs> that day. What about the pizza? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My funniest story I'm going to entitle, When Ears Can See. So my first experience in clinical medicine at UCLA, you actually don't touch patients until your second year 
And our second year, my, my very close friend and partner, Alex, were assigned to a physician named J. Michael Criley. You know you're in trouble when your attending starts his first name with an initial. That's never good, okay. He was from Harvard. He was one of the chief cardiologists in the world. And in fact, he had discovered this condition, which many of you may have heard, called mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse was discovered by this very eminent cardiologist, Dr. Criley, who um, my, my good friend and I were assigned to. Um, so we went around with Dr. Criley. Now I should tell you, Dr. Criley, if he was here, would hear mitral prolapse in every one of you, okay? <laughs> I don't think he ever met somebody who didn't have mitral prolapse. And it was his job in life to make sure my partner and I actually were very good at uh, diagnosing this. Unfortunately, he had two people who probably had more earwax than Dr. Vincent's patient at the beginning because unfortunately uh, the two of us couldn't hear a thing. So what he did was went patient to patient for patient. This is really, you've got to realize this, over a period of three months teaching us to listen very carefully for this click murmur, this, this very diagnostic part of mitral prolapse. And finally, finally, he found a young woman, which by the way, young women, it tends to happen more than others, uh, who had what he thought was the loudest, clearest, most obvious mitral prolapse in the history of the world. So we went to her bedside, and he turned to her in his very gentlemanly, he's a very uh, conservative physician, and said, uh, Miss, would you mind having my two lackeys, uh, <laughs> young physicians uh, over here, listen to your prolapse? And what was very interesting was what happened then. This woman, who was about 25, without any hesitation, said absolutely, pulled off her blouse, and there she was in all of God's glory with her mitral valve prolapse showing. Um, <laughs> what we did not learn until a little bit later was this woman was the previous Miss July centerfold for Playboy magazine. <laughs> And what she had been doing, which we then saw, was she had the centerfolds that she was signing for other patients and, frankly, most of the doctors <laughs> in, in, in the health center. So Dr. Criley asked me to go first, and uh, honestly, I listened for probably a good 45 minutes. <laughs> um, let me remind you, I was a 23-year-old male medical student, and uh, unfortunately, I heard nothing. In fact, I probably would not have heard a fire truck if it was about to run over me. So really crestfallen, I looked up at Dr. Criley, shook my head and said, I I'm sorry. He was not happy. He put me away and he said, all right, Alex, you're next. Within seconds, seconds, Alex said, my God, I found it. And he smiled the smile that any of us would have just lit up a room. And he said, Jim, I hear it. Click murmur, click murmur, click murmur. And I turned to him and I said, Alex, you don't hear it. And he goes, no, I do, I do, I really hear it. It's perfect, I've never heard anything clear. Click murmur, click murmur, click murmur. Anyways, this went on back and forth for a few minutes until finally Miss July started giggling and Dr. Crowley looked like he was going to have a stroke. Um, Alex looked so sincere that I actually went over, put my arm around him and escorted him out of the room because his stethoscope was actually around his neck. <laughs> I don't need to say any more. <laughs> there is, however, a, a, a caveat, a happy ending to this story, which I'm delighted to say, which is my dear friend Alex went on to become a cardiologist. <laughs> if you can believe that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the conclusion of our show. Please join me in thanking our remarkable panel of doctors who really were kind and brave enough to share with us their personal feelings 
and candid stories from their amazing and ongoing medical careers. So, th ladies and gentlemen, thank you. <laughs> But, but let me just mention to those of you who are still here, before you leave, we do have a few gifts. Uh, first of all, I would love to give to my junior colleague, Dr. Jennifer Vinson, a box of candy because she were, will be forever our candy striper. <laughs> and also her very own ear cleaning kit. <laughs> Secondly, um, to Dr. Iwasiak, I would like on behalf of him showing up here today so um, you know, energetic and really sharing with us some amazing stories over his 45 careers in medicine, I would like to give him a new pair of farmer's gloves <laughs> and some Smith & Hawkins cultivator for your new spring harvest. <laughs> And finally, to our dear friend Allison Schumann, I'd like to give you a new pair of weightlifting gloves <laughs> and an official Community Memorial Health System workout shirt. <laughs> Just in conclusion, I hope all of our stories made you laugh a little bit, think a little bit, maybe inspired some of you to create your own new stories with the people who care most about you and wish you only the best, your physicians and the people who are there to help you. Thanks again to Community Memorial Health System for their extremely kind support of this Community Ethics Forum. A little pitch, please join us again next month on April 16th, which will be a Thursday, same time, same place where we will be discussing the extremely controversial and frankly very important subject of physician-assisted suicide and ask the difficult and terribly important question, is death ever the best treatment? For tonight, however, thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate you being here. We hope to see you again soon. Good night.